Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Workplace Therapy. It's a weekly podcast where we discuss the challenges of working together and doing the work of healing together. My name is Scott Arietta. I'm the founder and CEO of Unity and Company. It's a consulting firm that leverages a strategic understanding of human experiences to help organizations unlock best in class performance. Now I'm joined today by my co-host, Sky Lily Wendowski. She's our director of special programs. And this week we are so excited to have Azizi Marshall on the show. Um, so before we get started, want to introduce you all to Azizi a little bit. She's the founder and CEO of the Center for Creative Arts Therapy and the owner of Creative Clinical Consulting. She has graduate degrees in community mental health and theater. Um, Azizi combines her unique expertise to bring forth a creative mental health approach and offer straightforward business advice. She's worked with clients around the world on how to create and sustain the health healthiest and most successful versions of their business possible. We are so thrilled to have you, Azizi, because it sounds like we are kindred spirits and this is going to be a great discussion. Oh, I am so excited too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And Azizi, could you tell us just a little bit more about your background? And also to start off, I heard you're a big coffee drinker. So I'd love to start out with like, what's your normal coffee order? Oh, yeah, I've already thrown down coffee today. So it is the oat milk latte, especially if like the, the Mexican coffee where you've got that cinnamon in there. That is my favorite. So mm. yes, coffee is life. If, if I can hashtag <laughs> a tattoo on myself, that's what it would be. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm originally from Des Moines, Iowa. Both of my parents were therapists and I never thought I'd end up in this field because I was that rebellious teenager and moved to Chicago to become an actor. And things changed a, a lot when I started working with inner city youth, doing theater, having them tell their stories. And I realized a lot of stuff that was coming up needed more than what I was able to provide. I wanted to be able to support them in the emotional aspects of what was coming up as they were telling their story and sharing it to a huge audience. It, it was a, a, a huge shift for them as far as how they were seeing themselves. And I wanted to be able to help support them even further than what I was able to do. So I went through a lot of school, <laughs> like a lot of school, went back to school for, for community counseling and another degree in theater and combined that all into additional training to become a drama therapist. So I'm a board certified drama therapist, so I can train people to become drama therapists. And I just absolutely love how powerful theater is in tandem with, uh, with therapy. And so now my mom's really excited that I am in the field with her. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. I mean, what do you think the biggest ties are between drama and therapy? Because to me, the correlation between the two is not obvious, but I'm sure that you've unlocked ways of incorporating them both. Well, I, I, I love what um, John Bergman, he did a lot of theater with with prisons, and he's actually somebody who I look up to as far as doing the work. And he basically said that we're on stage all the time. We're acting mm. in different roles all the time. And so if we can practice these things that we're maybe scared of, or that gives us a lot of anxiety, or that makes us angry, right? So how, how can we play those out and explore those emotions in a safe way? way. So then when we bring those experiences back to our daily life, we're much more prepared because our body and our mind and our emotions already have experienced that event. Hmm. That's so insightful. It actually reminds me of feedback that I got as an early leader earlier in my career. My very first leadership position, and I'll count it because it was very formative, was at Starbucks. Um, yes. And I got, I, I know, like we're tying in coffee and leadership and, and drama. Yeah. So, um, so I was young. I was like just out of just out of high school, paying my way through um, college. And I had a boss at the time who I just didn't realize at the time just how wise and, you know, how much of a mentor um, she was and still is actually in my life to this day. But like one of the things that she taught me early on, one of her early lessons was I was, you know, I was young and kind of wore my heart on my sleeve in terms of emotions, which when you're working in the retail restaurant industry, it's like that can be a liability if you're trying to create, you know, what Starbucks at the time would call this third place environment, this place that is your safe place between work and between home, where you can congregate as a community and like really kind of feel accepted and like, you know, and safe. And, um, and so the way that we showed up 
in the service industry to create that space for them was kind of an acting gig. And like, that was the first real lesson that she taught me. She's like, Scott, you're always on, like your feelings are real. Like you have every right to feel the way that you do, but you have to consider what is the impact on other people based off of the way that you're showing up right now, not just the customers, but to your team, you're now responsible for them and to the energy that they bring to the floor. Right. And like your energy multiplies. And, um, and so like that really was the first kind of like seedling of a leadership lesson that I got in like the corporate leadership space. And so it's interesting that your background has really kind of helped me to dig really deep. I won't say how many decades, but um, dig really deep to remember that example. Um, anyway, I, I'm fascinated to dig in more with you. Now, um, before you started working with corporate clients, like you worked in a psychiatric facility is my understanding. And I, like, I'm sure that that experience made a huge impact on how you think about mental health. Um, so what did you learn from working there? And like, I'm really interested in to, like, what's a typical day in the life even look like working in that kind of environment? It's, it's interesting you asked that because there's there was no real typical day. We ran a lot of groups. And so that was the, the majority of what we did. But it was on different units. So we would be working with the adolescent girls unit, the um, pediatric kids wing. And that's where they had both boys and girls. And then they had the adult wing, the senior wing. There was a residential um, center that hosted um, boys who had sexually offended. So it depended on, okay, this day I'm here, this day I'm here, different, different floors. Uh, and sometimes we would have individual sessions to where the psychiatrist thought that they really needed some additional one-on-one -on -one support by therapists, specifically creative arts therapists that could really tap into what was going on with the patient. And so that was really cool when we got those assignments. So um, it definitely shaped the work that I do now because in the psychiatric hospital, it's a lot of putting band-aids on just gaping wounds and just it's enough just to keep the wound closed. And then what's really cool is now I get the clients after they've come out of the psychiatric facilities to then let's really suture this up. Let's Let's clean this out. Let's make sure it's not infected and just really make sure it's tight and, and more in like a safe way for them to be able to heal more appropriately. Yeah, the psychiatric facility sounds honestly like a little intimidating as a job. Just like you said, like it's it's like you're having to kind of deal with different patients every single day and work what's best for them. Was there an experience that you found was like really transformative that you think back to now that you're like, oh, I remember that when I think about like my time there. I remember a lot of stories that my husband didn't want to hear anymore. <laughs> I would come home and I would tell him, oh, this happened, this happened. And I would say there were so many moments where you would see somebody and, and in who, anybody who's worked in inpatient psych knows that it's it's kind of a revolving door that you work with somebody and then you'll see them back in the psychiatric facility, you know, maybe a couple months down the road, maybe another year and you'll see them again. And so it was just transformative for them because each time they came back in, they learned something different. So they didn't come back in as often. So that was really nice to see that the work that we were doing was making a true change. I do remember a, a, a psychiatrist who didn't really believe in creative arts therapy, but he came to one of my groups because I had basically told him, like, you really need to come and see what we do so you really understand. And he's like, oh, OK, I'll come to one. And he came to one of our, our music therapy groups. And this one woman who was nonverbal to all the rest of the staff um, did not engage with any other person on the floor. She immediately picked up one of the instruments and started singing with us. And he was like, I didn't know she moved. I didn't know she spoke, let alone sing. He was like, can you do a one-on-one -on -one with her? I'm like, yeah, so this is what I've been telling you about. So I'm glad you're on the bandwagon. <laughs> So it's just those little, those moments where it's like, yes, this is true work and this is changing people's lives and, and helping them just come to a different place than where they entered in from. It's just so impactful. I'm, I'm drawing a connection between how I feel like Western society in particular 
has kind of aggressively disassociated the arts as like a discretionary thing, right? Like if you think about like our educational context and the things that we value, like as a society, it seems like, you know, the arts are not really like held like on the same kind of pedestal. And I wonder if some of the skepticism that you're met with as you do these engagements is kind of like a natural consequence of the value that we as a primarily capitalist society kind of like place on things. So I'll start there with just to get your reactions, because I definitely have thoughts as I've explored this in my own life too. Yeah, I would say, and and even within the arts, there's a hierarchy, right? Visual Mm -hmm. arts is usually at the top and then, Mm -hmm. and then music, and then you have dance and then you have theater. So just the fact Mm -hmm. that I'm a drama therapist, we're already Mm -hmm. down here in the totem pole. Interesting. Uh, Yeah. And it's, it's Mm -hmm. just so empowering though, to, to see when people finally get to engage in the arts and realize that it is such an effective tool because we have pushed it to the side for a very long time. And that's because it also has a very spiritual ritualistic component to it. And so Mm. people who haven't tapped into that or who are close off to that as an option tend to push it away because it it can be scary, right? It's something that you've been told Mm. in school, you have to do a certain way. And they're even in art class, Mm. they're saying, Oh, make sure to shade that in. Right. Or can you add more color to that? And, and, and I, that's the best part about creative arts therapies is you can push against this. Like you don't have to add any color to that. You can put a dot on the page and that says enough. So it, it, it op- it's open more for interpretation as people start to explore it as far as how it can really help them. That's so interesting that you say that. Cause like what I picked up from what you said is how, like, even when we engage in the arts, you know, in kind of the context of our Western society, it's, we take more of like a skill-based approach or a competency-based approach to art rather than a creative expression-based approach to art, right? So what you're saying is art is supposed to be this playground free of boundaries and constraints, right? Um, And yet even the way that we like teach art and like communicate our appreciation for it has to do with technical proficiency, like a lot of the time. Right. And I, and it's funny because like these stories take me back to, you know, grade school and primary school where it's like, I started reinforcing narratives about myself and my creative abilities based off of how I did or did not do on those topics academically. Right. Like my handwriting was messy. I, you know, I assessed early on. I had no aptitude for the visual arts. Like I loved music, but I was very insecure about it because I couldn't read sheet music and didn't understand theory, but thought that compositionally, like I was pretty decent. And that's where I had a lot of fun, but didn't really give myself permission to explore that because academics were more important. Right. And, you know, I wasn't top 1% from like a subject matter expertise perspective and like, um, anyway, like that's really interesting, um, to kind of hear your perspective on that. Um, so I'm also very interested in hearing about how, you know, the arts and the work that you do, if you've seen its impact on burnout, especially within corporate cultures these days, because, you know, I think um, I was actually just having a conversation this morning um, with a friend of mine who recently took a C-level position. And, you know, he was um, he was just talking about how, um, you know, from a macroeconomic perspective, like the level of productivity and output that we have been um, capturing on a per capita basis from our workforce has been exponentially improving over the last several decades. But if you look at wage growth and work-life balance and other factors, they're not taking off to the same degree. And furthermore, when you normalize for technological efficiency, right? Like you could say, oh yeah, people are more productive because we have Google now and we have computers now and we have machines now. But even after you normalize for that, that doesn't account for all of the gains. And so the implication is from a numbers perspective, the way that we are getting more productivity 
out of our workforce is not because of machines and it's not because of computers and it's not because we're getting better or smarter as a society. It's because we're just squeezing harder. You know, we're burning people out faster and more unapologetically. And, you know, for me, my story was, um, you know, I did kind of get squeezed and really reconsidered my priorities and what I wanted to accomplish in this life and music and tapping back into music. It's why I have the guitars on the wall um, as a visual reminder of my um, the responsibility I have to myself to make those investments like I'm a different person, Azizi. Like I'm like more mission oriented. I'm more creative. Like I have more stamina. I'm more connected to the work that I do. And some of that's environmental, but a lot of it's because of the investment that I'm making um, into the arts. And so I'm just interested to see, because you probably have a lot more than my singular data point. Like what what are stories that you've seen for how investing in the creative arts helps to address issues of burnout and engagement? Yeah. So when we have somebody come into our, our practice, people don't want to talk about what they're experiencing. It's hard to find the words for it. It's hard to tap into some of those memories from way, way back because they, they've disassociated from it. And in, in a way to keep them safe. So when you sit a client in front of you and say, okay, so tell me about your past trauma. That's <laughs> it's, they can't find the words for it. It's too scary. So when you say, show me on this piece of paper, what it feels like. So it's not, they're not drawing out their trauma and, and the, the exact picture of it, but just what is the feeling that you had in that moment? And they can show you on the paper visually, it, it distances it enough for them to be able to put it out there and look at it without bringing it to the body just yet. And then once they're more able to talk about it and process it through the visual arts, then they can bring it more into the body. They can show then with their body what that emotion looks like. And so each layer helps them express this, this challenging situation, this traumatic situation that they may have experienced in a safer way and in a different way so that their body can start to reconnect with, oh, this is what I went through, but it's not as scary as it was before. So tapping into those arts is just so important because it lets us express ourselves in very different ways that we haven't been able to before. Hmm. Aziza, you're, you're hitting on all the themes of my life right now. Um, and like, it's really interesting because at Unity and Company, the company that sponsors this uh, podcast, we, um, we're actually working on incorporating somatic techniques into our executive coaching and leadership development offerings. And so one of the things that we did recently is we're launching a feedback training to teach people how to give and receive feedback effectively. But the entire preamble to it is what is happening in your body? Like, what are the sensations that you are feeling? How does that ladder up to the, the thoughts that you are having, the words that you are putting together with those thoughts? And then the culmination of all those things are what actually end up showing up in the workplace. But we, I think as a society, or at least this has been my experience as a citizen of the society, it's almost like every aspect of our formative development, we're being encouraged to separate that mind-body connection action, right? Like we're told to push through, to ignore what our body is telling us in the name of mental toughness or productivity or responsibility or corporate loyalty or whatever, right? And to the point where like, I'm now middle-aged and I have a really hard time with the sensation base, like getting all the way back to how my body is like reacting to the things in my environment is a really tough exercise for me, um, but I'm getting better at it with practice. And so I... I'm wondering, like you mentioned a lot about how art opens the gateway so that people can bring and connect with this trauma more in their body and begin that work of healing. Um, is that like aligned with like my observations on that or like, tell me more about this body connection in the work that you do? Yeah. So the body connection is so important because when, when we do trainings on mental health at work, it's, it's one thing to put a PowerPoint in front, in front of somebody and say, okay, this is what you do when you're feeling stressed. This is what you do to help a colleague when they're feeling emotionally burnt out versus, okay, this is what you do when you're stressed. And now we're going to practice it together. 
and for them to step into it and then understand through their reactions, does this work for you? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So then we practice all the other options. So then they find the one that works and they go, oh, this one works really well. And they could feel it in their body. And then we just keep practicing it in the moment for them to just really get into that Zen state. So then when they're out in those moments that are stressing them out, they're like, I can know, I can go right back to my Zen place because I already practiced it. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, would you mind sharing like what personally puts you into your Zen state? Like what activity does that for you? I would say playing my cello and my husband, if he was here, he would be laughing at me right now because, <laughs> because I only pick up my cello when I'm having a particularly stressful day. And so it's almost like the family knows when mom's playing cello, don't open the door. <laughs> and it really does help because I, I'll pick it up maybe once a month or so when things are just really heavy with the work that we're doing. And it just allows me that, that moment to just let it go. It's a physical release because you're playing and especially if you play Vivaldi four seasons it's just boom it just all comes out you have the melancholy you have the upbeat and it's just really helpful to express myself in that way and I let the emotions out and I just feel so much better afterwards so that's it yeah the cello is my go-to <laughs> I love it like the kids come in and they hear the cello and they're like actually we're gonna go get some ice cream now like we're gonna <laughs> Exactly. They, they know what to do. That's really funny. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me, we had talked about uh, you help organizations, uh, individuals at organizations do these calm down kits, which are very personalized. Could you talk a little bit more about those and, and how they can help when you are stressed at work? Yeah, I love the calm down kits. I started using them for the little kids I worked with um, who had a lot of behavioral issues, were struggling with ADHD and just could not calm down. <laughs> and so we would make their own little kits because there wasn't a place they could go in the room to step away from the class. They had to stay. So I said, okay, well, let's look at all of the senses. Like, what are the things that you like to touch? And so they'd, they'd cut a little piece of their blanket that they liked so they could feel that. And then there's putty. What do you like to look at? Well, they like pictures of their dog. So they'd put a little polar of their dog in there. What are the things you like to smell? And they'd have different scents um, and different things that they could taste too. So we had to be careful with the little kids because they'd put all the chocolate in there and just eat all that all day. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's taking all the senses of things that make us feel calm, that help us relieve the stress. And adults, it works so well for them too, because if you're feeling stressed out, you have your own calm down kit. And Sometimes certain things don't work, but if you have a whole kit that attaches all of the different senses, you can try all the things until something fits for the moment. That's so interesting. So the goal of these calm down kits is to touch or to engage all of the senses in ways that are specifically meaningful to you. Interesting. Is it contextual based off of the person or is there a particular sense that tends to be the most effective in facilitating those feelings of calm in your experience? I would say it's definitely per, it's definitely individualized because I would say my youngest daughter, you would think that she would like like nice, calm music, right? To soothe her. And I remember taking her to this mommy and me music class. And whenever they play slow music, she would start crying and try to run out of the room. <laughs> she does not like calm, soothing music. She likes rap and hip hop to help her go to sleep. So if you were to put calm, soothing music in hers, it would just agitate her. So knowing who you are as an individual and what calms you down, that's what's important to put into the calm down kit. That's so funny. It's easy. It reminds me of my son. So we were talking about our kids before the session and my son is almost 12 and he has ADHD. We've talked about him on the show a few times before, but um, yeah, he loves he loves music and he has to fall asleep to like some kind of ambient sound, but it's like, it's a, it's a running joke in our house because it's almost like because of his ADHD, like the thoughts in his brain are just like moving at a million miles an hour. And there's like, it's an information super highway in there. And so like the way that we've kind of conceptualized it is like, he can't put himself to sleep because his brain is like, you know, pedal to the metal. And so we bought him an Alexa for his room and he plays these rainforest sounds, um, 
like, but at full blast is easy. So like when we walk down the hallway of the house, like it sounds like we're in Costa Rica, <laughs> like we're sleeping on the bottom of like the rainforest floor. And it's like, like my wife will be like watching TV in the living room and be like, what is this? She's like, the birds are driving me crazy. And I'm like, well, our son's asleep. So that's good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever they need. Right. <laughs> exactly. This reminds me of, I think, it's like the running joke, I think, on, you know, Instagram or whatever now is like that women are soothing themselves by listening to like true crime podcasts. And I'm like, I don't know if that's like, <laughs> I don't think that should be in my calm down kit. Like I, I do find like on Netflix, I, I watch like unsolved mysteries and I'm like, this is like oddly soothing that something is unsolved. Like, why? Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> And Azizi, you talked earlier about, you know, what, how you can help other people at work. Like maybe we we don't know what's going on with other people at work. I don't know all the time what Scott is going through, but sometimes I can kind of sense like, oh, this may be like, he's having a tough day. So what do you recommend to coworkers to like help out um, their colleagues at work when like, when they are having a, a tough mental health day because everything is so personalized and like what works for me may not work for Scott. And so what do you usually share to your clients? Yeah, I would say just like you pointed out, Skylar, when you when you notice that, oh, something's going on with Scott today, let me check in with them. It's just the observation. So first observing when somebody's having just a shift in behavior or a shift in mood or like, oh, something's off, let me check in. And then doing that connection where you take them to the side, right? It's not like you bring it up in the meeting with a bunch of other people. It's just like, Hey, do you have a second? And then just ask, how are you doing? And sometimes you have to ask it more than once because everybody usually does. Oh, fine. I'm doing great. Just, you know, good versus no, really, how are you doing? And usually after that second one, somebody will give you a little bit more information and then you can then respond in a way that can give them resources or support. I, I like to have just a, a handout. So whenever I work with an organization, we have a very easy kind of like cheat sheet of anybody can hand this to anybody. So if an organization has an EAP, they can have that information on there. They can have NAMI's helpline. They can have just a bunch of different resources that people can, can access. And so that way they don't even have to have the conversation. Just like, here is this information. If you need anything else, let me know. I want to make sure that you're doing okay. And then you can do what I like to call the follow-up. So then maybe the next day or two, you check and be like, hey, just want to see how you're doing after yesterday or last week. Do you need anything? Were you able to follow up with stuff? Do you, do you need any additional resources? And so that way people know that somebody's got their back in the workplace because a lot of times... I, employees and and even leadership teams feel like there's nobody who really understands what I'm going through and nobody has my back. And I just feel like I'm doing this alone. And so if even just one person on the team can recognize something and then have the conversation, then that employee is more likely to stay because they feel like they have the support. Yes. Well, and I mean, observationally, you know, from the work that you do, Azizi, that is true, but it's also true in study after study after study, like of employee engagement, like having a sense of connecti- connectivity to the people who you work with. Um, famously, there's a there's a company called Gallup. Most people know Gallup because of their presidential polling, but they also um, <clears throat> have a number of consulting offerings. Um, in the employee engagement space. And one of them is their Q12 employee engagement framework for which one of their key employee engagement questions is the answer to the question, I have a best friend at work, right? And really what I think that question is trying to get at the heart of is, is there somebody at work who cares about you, who cares about you enough to ask how you're doing twice, (laughs) you know, and actually listen to the answer? Um, and unfortunately, I I just think that that's more rare than it should be. Right. And I feel like I'm interested, like, I want to get your, um, your spicy take on this is easy, but like, um, so Skylar came up with this series that we're doing on the podcast called weaponized words. Um, so these words that are supposed to be connotatively positive, but they're like used in the workplace as a method of kind of 
control and borderline manipulation to get you to feel a certain way about certain behaviors that are, make us fundamentally human. And it's because those fundamentally human behaviors are just harder to manage. And so a lot of workplaces would rather that we just not express those traits. And one of the weaponized words we talk about all the time is professionalism, right? And like, obviously, like we believe in professionalism, right? You don't want to make people uncomfortable. You don't want to be offensive, right? You know, but there's also a shadow side where you can evolve to a version of yourself that is so professional that it's no longer a representation of who you are. Like you don't feel free to answer the question, how are you doing? Honestly and truthfully, um, because we feel like it violates this expectation of how we're supposed to show up in the workplace. So I'm interested because you do all of this work to get people in touch with their humanity in the context of the workplace, which I think in and of itself is just like bravo to you for finding workplaces that are willing, you know, and open to engaging in that kind of work. Um, and I like, I wish that that were just more prevalent, but I'm interested if in your travels, you come across this weaponization of professionalism and what are your observations about the impacts that that has to the people who work there? Yeah, I think the definition of professionalism and, and the context in which it's being used is so important because for us as therapists, professionalism is not just the, I'm a robot, tell me about your problems, I will spit out answers to you. It's more of us being able to be empathetic with the person who's sitting across the room from us to be able to truly understand where they're coming from and how they could be feeling about that situation. And then also is the just the autonomy to be able to be who we are. So here I am being very professional in this podcast, but depending on the client that I'm working with, there may be some F-bombs that are thrown out there. There may be some expletives because that's what they hear. And I worked with, especially in, in, the past, in my past, worked with a lot of teenagers with behavioral issues. So if I didn't drop an F-bomb, they weren't going to get my message. So sometimes that version of professionalism needs to change based on who you're working with because you want to be able to connect with them. It's so funny you mentioned that because I was reading a study the other day about how if you're in a conversation where one person uses profanity, um, trust increases on average. And if you're in a conversation <laughs> where two people use profanity, trust goes off the charts. <laughs> it's like, and so it's so funny because, um, I, um, I was really proud of this one podcast that we had with, um, a colleague of Skylar and I's who's a professional storyteller. He just tells stories that are just so goddamn beautiful. It just like makes me cry thinking about them. Um, but as a, um, as a professional purveyor of words, um, he has a proclivity for the four letter variety and we were having fun on this, on this podcast. And I showed it to my parents um, who are very like conservative and my, my mom texts me back and she's like, I like the content, but I would prefer if you didn't curse. And I was like, oh, mom. I'm like, well, you know what, if you weren't there, that was such a high trust environment <laughs> for me, mom. Like that was fantastic. Um, but yeah, I totally get what you're saying about the, about the environment. And I, before we lose sight of this, I love what you did and not sure if it was like on purpose, probably was that you flip the script with regards to professionalism. Right. And I think that's revelatory of the baggage that I have about how the word professionalism has been weaponized against me in my career. But you dared to say that professionalism is actually having empathy for the person sitting across the desk from you, right? It is being able to engage with them without feeling threatened by the responses to how they're doing and what they need, right? And it is in fact your responsibility to be responsive to that. And I think like my perspective is um, that's 100% true, but just like uncommon in practice. I think it's actually more common you know, for 
managers to be taught that they have to deliver the hard message and they have to stand firm and they have to keep people at arm's length because it makes it easier for them to administer performance management, you know, for lack of performance over time. And it's all this self-protective, anesthetizing kind of um, approach to management, you know, which is very much built around what can you give to us versus how can I help you to be your best place in this context so that what you give to us is taken care of, you know? And um, anyway, I just, I really appreciate you saying that because I mean, I felt seen in that moment. So. Oh, beautiful. I'm glad you felt seen, Scott. <laughs> Scott, I don't know if you remember this too, but I think when you left Tile, um, you actually gave me this button and it was the bullshit button. <laughs> so just bringing it back to the profanity. <laughs> You had this like button on your desk. Was, like, I have a legacy of profanity. <laughs> profanity is like one of my leadership characteristics. It sounds oh, like, okay. That that's great. Celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, look, we developed language. We should use it to its maximum extent. <laughs> it, it really did help like throughout the day if something happened where... Like you can't do anything about it. You know, we were in customer service and when I went on to like the chief of staff role, there was just a lot of, you know, situations that came up there. You're like, all right, like this sucks, but I'm still going to power through. It was, it was helpful to just like hit it and like hear the like bullshit come out. You're like, all right, okay. Somebody sees me. This button sees me (laughs) even if nobody else does, but that's okay. (laughs) Um, Which I think brings me to another question around, a lot of people are in pretty toxic cultures right now, but not in a place to leave their job. Like it's kind of a tough environment. A lot of people are getting laid off. And so, you know, my friends are like, Oh, I can't leave. Like everybody else is losing their job. I need to stay here, but it's not the best culture fit for me right now. So I'm wondering if there is a way to still engage, still enjoy your job, even if it has a bit of a toxic culture And if not, like maybe what are some like self-care tips that you do recommend to people who are in these toxic cultures, but can't leave right now? Yeah, it it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of how you step into this role or this character. So as actors, we're trained to stay in role, right? So when we go into work, we step into role, we're stepping into the workplace, and we're playing this character out. And then when we leave, we leave the character there, because you've seen many actors who get into those really intense roles that they play in movies, and then they have to take like two years off because they've gotten way too deep into that role. And it was a really difficult one. So that's where a lot of people are. They're in that toxic workplace, that really difficult role that they have to play. And so what actors do is what's called de-rolling. So something as simple as taking a a backpack and when you, you pick that backpack up when you get there, it's an imaginary backpack, right? And you walk in and then when you're done, you put the backpack down and you leave it at work. Or another way, which I do, I did it a lot when I worked in the psychiatric facility because there was a lot of stuff we experienced when we were there. So I would come home and I would change into my comfy clothes or for a really difficult day, I would take a shower and then get into my pajamas because I literally washed the character off because it was a lot to hold space for really highly acute individuals who were really struggling um, where they were at their most raw and then try to hold that for them, but then also deal with chairs being thrown at you, curses. I mean, we had fecal matter thrown at us. We were bit, we were spit on. And so those were situations that I would come home as like, I literally need a shower because I've been spit on today, but then also I need to wash off what I experienced so that I can be mindful and present with my family. So that was really helpful to just use those actor skills of de-rolling, letting that character go, knowing that that wasn't me who I wanted to hold on to. It was a, a role I was playing when I was at work. And that helped to create some boundaries for work and then home. I really love that. I mean, so much like, um, I think I'm just going to be taking a lot more showers. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but like, ser- like I, so when, um, you know, my son with, you know, with ADHD, like sometimes, you know, he will get overly stimulated and he'll have a hard time regulating his, his emotions. Right. And, um, 
And one of the only things that works for him is, you know, taking a shower, changing his physical state. And it's like he's the the change is dramatic. And and I don't want to like peg it on ADHD. It's like I think his ADHD is the only reason that we had to start developing playbooks for this stuff. But I think the things that we do to help him are universally applicable to anybody, regardless of neurodivergent status, right? Because I know like for me, like if I need to get in the game or if I need to step away, like I've been doing it subconsciously, but like I will take, you know, a shower and it'll like, what I was telling myself before is like, it wakes me up and it makes me feel more energized. But I think really what's happening is you're de-rolling. You're like cleansing yourself of whatever context you previously found yourself in that is causing that state of emotional dysregulation. And you're allowing yourself the space and the stimulus to reset. Um, So I think that that's a power tip for sure. Um, So thank you for sharing. Yeah, I think it's interesting because now that we're working from home a lot, we usually don't take those extra steps. Like I am in my, you know, like, I don't know, like easy pants throughout the day when I'm sitting, like I'm not in my work pants anymore. And so it's like, it's hard for me when I am working from home to like, oh, I'm going to go change into a different set of clothes and take a shower. Like it, it's interesting now that like the similarities between like, oh, this is why working from home is a little bit tough because you you don't have that space to de-roll. Have you seen that with your clients that work a lot of remote positions? Yeah, absolutely. So we had to create different strategies or or what some of them like to call rituals, where if they're working in the office that, especially an office from home, they will light a candle or they'll play a piece of music or some of them, like they tell their family, I'm going on a walk. When I come back, I will be ready to serve you. You know, <laughs> So just kind of just changing, the, adding a, a wonderful transition from your work from home office to then your daily life is is super helpful. So the walk is wonderful, the lighting a candle, listening to music, just even meditating, just sitting in silence, if you can in your household for for just even two minutes, just to allow your brain a chance to go, okay, we're letting all of that go. And now I'm ready to say hello. Yeah. Powerful, powerful stuff. Um, Azizi, like we could talk to you for hours if it's not apparent already. Oh, same. Um, all of this stuff. <laughs> um, but you know, I think um, I think it's time for us to move to the lightning round. So the rules of the lightning round are simple. We have a series of questions. We ask all of our guests. Some of them are work related, others are not. Um, and the whole goal is to just take thirty seconds off the cuff, answer the questions to the best of your ability, and Skylar will guide you through the list. So are you ready? All right, Perfect. let's do it. Take it away. <laughs> All right. First question. Who is a leader that you look up to and why? Oh, my dad. My dad is the one that basically trained me how to read people. We'd go to the mall and he'd be like, what's going on over there? And we'd add voices and all of that. So he really developed who I am as a therapist. So he would say a leader I look up to for sure. Love it. <laughs> uh, people watching at its best, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, what is your bucket list vacation destination and why? Ooh, I want to go back to Italy. So I went there as a foreign exchange student and I absolutely loved it. And I can't wait for my children to get a little bit older so they can really understand what the experience is. So that is a plan within the next few years to bring them back to Italy so I can show off my Italian skills too. (laughs) Where in Italy did you go, Azizi? I went everywhere, but my favorite place was Firenze. So Florence, and it's, it's probably the most beautiful. People will argue with me about what they think is more beautiful in Italy, but Florence was my favorite place. Really? Okay. It's on our list and we just have not figured out where, like where to go. Is it all doable? Like pretty, um, like how much time do you think is the optimal amount of time to a lot? Is it like months or weeks? Uh, Weeks. So you could, you could really fill up your itinerary with like two to three weeks and you could go a lot of places. If you can get to Southern Italy, that's super old school. I love it. Just like cobblestone everywhere. So just wear comfortable shoes. <laughs> I studied abroad in Italy and yeah, I, I, I disagree. I could go there for months. I could live there. Really? Forever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I 
mean, if you have the resources to be yeah. there for a couple months, go for it. The only place Skylar cannot be for months is her own home. Like, like working, working together with her, like she'll dial into a meeting and like, I have to constantly ask her, I'm like, I need to meet with you. What time zone are you in tomorrow? <laughs> because I have no idea. <laughs> Good for you, Skylar. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know either. So it's, that's the fun part. <laughs> All right. Next question. Can you tell us about the funniest or maybe most awkward moment that you've had in the workplace? Yes. So there, when I was working in the psychiatric facility, there was a woman who was feeling very, let's just say sexually activated. And she was just straight naked in the whole, <laughs> they called a code because she, you can't be naked, you know, on the wing. And so all the guys showed up and immediately when they came up, like, Oh no, I'm not dealing with that. And their hands were up like this. And she's like, come on boys. <laughs> it was just hilarious. Hilarious. Like I, and what was beautiful is I was behind the nurse's station. So I couldn't see anything from the shoulders down, but everybody who came on the unit could see everything. So that was probably my most memorable, uh, moment there <laughs> all right azizi wins that question so far yes. <laughs> I think, I think, like, that's, that's the best one that we've had so far. it was pretty awesome <laughs> okay what is the most useful non-work related app on your phone Oh, Zillow. So imagine the Saturday Night Live skit. That is totally me. I love just looking yes. at houses in random places and going, oh, that bathroom is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Me too is easy, but then I look, I look at like stuff in my zip code and then I'm like depressed <laughs> because I'm like, it's ridiculous. Well, it's like, I mean, it's, it's not like that depressing, but I think what is depressing is like, if you look at, we're at the point now because of interest rates where it's like, if you look at stuff that is parity in cost of the house that we're living in, the mortgage is not parity to the mortgage no. that we're paying. It's like no. double because the interest rates are like crazy these days. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, you can dream. Absolutely. No, it's like, do you have like a home aesthetic that you like? Like, are you a beach cottage person or forest or mansion? I'm, uh, I am a mid-century modern girl. Mm. So I love just like the the 70s decor and just like pops of color everywhere. So, but then every, then, every now and then I like to go a little boho chic. So it just mm. kind of depends on my mood. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Okay. What is the most important thing that you've done to invest in your mental health? My own personal therapy. I would say for sure. If, if it wasn't for the therapist that I have engaged with, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I'm so grateful for all of the work that they had me do and that they sat with me and being a therapist now, I understand just how much, how much they had to hold for me. So all of my therapists out there who helped me, thank you. <laughs> So nice. Yeah. The therapists go to therap therapy, so it's useful for everybody. Okay. What's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, I had to think about that for a while, but it is definitely when people are not kind to other people. And so that's where my husband's always saying, can you not say something? I'm like, no, I have to. And so <laughs> I, I am the person who will step and be like, can we maybe look at this in a different way? <laughs> it's like, you don't have to step into everything. Um, and so I've had to push myself back on certain moments, but definitely when somebody is just unkind to somebody just for no reason, um, that, that is definitely a pet peeve of mine. You would have a lot of pet peeves in the customer service world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm the first one to step in when a customer is being rude to somebody <laughs> who's working there. <laughs> yes. Okay. What is What piece of literature or maybe art, maybe going back to Florence, has shaped your perspective on life? Oh, the Theater of the Oppressed by Augusta Boal that influences a lot of my work. So his study was in theater and how he could use that as a way for people to understand what it means to be an oppressor versus somebody who's oppressed. And you can switch those roles and dynamics so then people can come out on the other side understanding both points of views. 
So that that goes across all of the work I do because I come in and I work with leadership and I work with employees and for them to have to come together and truly understand why leadership is making this choice and why employees are reacting to those choices helps them see and, and, and appreciate what each person is going through. Definitely have to put that on the reading list. We need a, a book club, workplace therapy book club again. Yes, it's a good one. <laughs> Okay. And last question, what is your mission in life? To help as many people as possible with their mental health. So just, I mean, that's just, it's even up here. It's on my board <laughs> to, to make the biggest impact. So it, it goes in multiple ways where I'm, I'm training therapists to be able to use the creative arts therapies in their work. And then they make ripples with their clients. When I go into workplaces, I work with the leadership team and they make ripples within their organization. And then those employees make ripples with their family. So I'm trying to create as many ripples as possible. Uh. I love that is easy. And um, we resonate with you so hard um, on that piece. Um, it's part of the reason that we've chosen to do the work that we do is for the multiplicative impact that we can have with people who are like-minded or strike a chord with the things that we talk about. So with that being said, Azizi, I want to just thank you so much for the time that you've spent with us, the wisdom that you've given to us. I want to hand you the mic for 60 seconds or so, because I think it's so important to give our listeners the opportunity if they would like to work with you or if they're intrigued about the work you do and want to learn more, what are the program offerings that you offer that are most popular and how can people people get a hold of you if they want to uh, uh, explore working with you? Yeah. So our, our most uh, wanted, I would say, training is called Mental Health in Action. So we use improvisation and theater of the oppressed as a way for um, multiple organizations with leadership and employees truly understand how to support somebody when they're struggling with a mental health issue. And the way they can reach us is by going to azizimarshall.com to find out more information about how that work is impacting other organizations organizations. Fantastic. And I highly encourage our listeners to go and check that out. We'll also be sure to include it on our website once we elevate the episode in the show notes um, so that they can check you out. And um, as we close here, um, again, uh, the Workplace Therapy Podcast is brought to you by Unity & Company. If you would like to explore more information on how Unity & Company can help you and your organization, including the uh, somatic-based feedback training that we talked about earlier in today's session, you can reach out to us at info at unityandcompany.com. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>